Now, the scientific data, the historical data, but then the scientific data in the Bible, this is where we can see clearly that this cannot be just human imagination. It's got to be divine inspiration. For example, the fact that the earth is spherical, bilugang mundo. You know, where did we learn that the earth is spherical? Of course, bilugang mundo, galing sa Hinebra San Miguel, na we learned that. But uh, Isaiah 40, 700 years before Christ even came, uh, it says here, He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. The word circle in Hebrew, it means spherical. And so again, for the longest time, we know that the earth is flat. And yet, here is Isaiah writing 700 years before Christ was born, that the earth is spherical. Of course, we uh, learned that through the voyages of Magellan and uh, Columbus and then the discovery of the compass. But that's already a 17th century. But here is Isaiah 700 years before Christ. Another one, the fact that the earth is suspended in space. We learned this from Sir Isaac Newton in 1687 AD, that the earth is just suspended in space. But Job, writing 1500 years before Christ was born, he said, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. And so, is that human speculation or that is that divine inspiration? He suspends the earth over nothing. And then the fact that the stars are innumerable. Today, that's no longer a question. And uh, we thought before when they described the stars, there will be as, as, uh, the same as the sun's. In the ocean, we thought that's just too impossible, exaggeration. But now we know that that is true. And yet, 150 AD, the Greek astronomer Ptolemy dogmatically declared that there are only 1,056 stars in the sky. So, gabi-gabi, binibilang niya, 1,056 talaga, you know. And uh, that's already 150 AD. And yet, 1,500 years before Christ was born, God was talking to Abraham, and God said to Abraham, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. The implication of if indeed is, of course, you cannot count them. All right? And so that's 1,500 years before Christ was even, uh, even born. Now, there's a book in my library, a small book. It's uh, called None of These Diseases by Dr. S. Macmillan. And he wrote about the diseases that we now have and how we can find the cure in the Bible. But in chapter 3, he talked about the scarcity of uh, cancer of the uh, cervix among Jewish women. Cervical cancer, there were very few cases among Jewish women. And so they were, they were trying to find out how this happened. And then they attributed the blessing to the rite of circumcision practiced by the Jewish males. And so this circumcision, you know, uh, an uncircumcised male, there is a, they say a smegma bacillus, a cancer-producing smegma bacillus that can be transferred from the uncircumcised male to the female during sexual relations. But that's not the issue in chapter 3 of the book. In chapter 3, they talked about the necessity of circumcision. When is the best time to circumcise? So here's chapter 3. It says there, there is one final but remarkably unique fact about the matter of circumcision. In November 1946, remember the year, 1946, an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association listed the reasons why circumcision of the newborn is advisable. Three months later, a letter from another specialist appeared in the same journal. He agreed heartily with the writer of the article on the advantages of circumcision, but he criticized him for failing to mention the safest time to perform the operation. This is a point well taken. L. Emmett Holt and Russell McIntosh report that a newborn infant has a peculiar susceptibility to bleeding between the second and fifth days of life. It is felt that the tendency to hemorrhage is due to the fact that the important blood clotting element vitamin K is not formed until the fifth to the seventh day. You know, I asked a, uh, a surgeon about this. He's a doctor in my Bible study group. Doc, if vitamin K appears between the fifth and the seventh day, then why is it that today, as soon as the baby is born, you circumcise the baby? And then the doctor said, Pastor Roy, we inject vitamin K on the baby. And so, because it appears between the fifth and the seventh day. 
A second element which is also necessary for the normal clotting of blood is protrombin. It appears based on the data from the science of pediatrics that an 8-day-old baby has more available protrombin than any other day in its entire life. It starts at, on the 8th day, 110% protrombin. And so, one observes from a consideration of vitamin K and protrombin determinations that the perfect day to perform a circumcision is on the 8th day. Now, what year was this? 1946. And yet, God was speaking with Abraham, and God said to Abraham, For the generations to come, every male among you who is 8 days old must be circumcised. And so again, you begin to just wonder, is this human speculation or is this divine revelation? How would they know that the eighth day is the perfect day for circumcision? Now, of course, today, <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're still single, you know, the girls, ladies here are single. If somebody courts you, how do you ask it? Tuli ka na ba? You cannot, you cannot ask the guy. I mean, especially if he's a Christian, if he's a Christian, he will say, you know, what is important is the circumcision of the heart. All right. <laughs> and that's what the Bible says, no? Galatians chapter 3. And so, pero that's, that's the problem. All right. Scientific ac accuracy. And then, of course, this, there's the prophetical accuracy of the Bible. Now, of all, of all the sacred books in all religions of the world, of all the sacred books, only the Bible has this prophetical accuracy. In the Bible, the more than 31,000 verses in the Bible, more than 8,000 contain a prediction. That's 80, That's 30% of the Bible containing a prediction. The Bible contains 1,817 individual predictions concerning 737 separate subjects. Out of the 737 separate subjects, 594 subjects have already come true. Friends, that's more than 80% of the biblical prophecy already fulfilled. The more than 15% that, you know, have not been fulfilled yet, they're all about the second coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the world, which obviously has not happened yet. But friends, when it comes to prophecy, now that's one of the amazing truths about the Bible, that it is indeed the inspired word of God. Now, if I ask you this afternoon, who would you consider the very first preacher in the Bible? Who would you consider the very first preacher in the Bible? Abraham, okay. You know, sometimes they say it was Eve because the wives, you know, usually they preach a lot. And um, I don't know. One time, you know, my wife and I were having a problem. We were going to a church and, you know, that was Sunday morning and we were having a fight. And you know, it's so hard to worship God. You know, you're fighting with your wife. Diba, tatas ka ng kamay mo. Sisikuhin mo na lang. You know, it's not easy to worship God. You know, you're having problems. You know what we said? I said to my wife, you know what? I don't want to go to church. Let's just talk about this first, you know. And so, you know what we did? We went to our bedroom. We had a worship service in our bedroom. My wife gave the sermon. I gave the tithes and offering. And so, uh, it was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so some, some say the wives, they're the first preachers. But actually, I believe that's, that it is uh, Enoch who was the first preacher in the Bible. In Genesis 5, it says here, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. Now, let's just understand this grammatically. How old was Enoch when he started walking with God? 65. Something happened when he turned 65 that he started walking with God. He became what? The father of Methuselah. Now, there's something about the birth of Methuselah that convicted Enoch to start walking with God. And especially the name Methuselah in Hebrew, it actually means when he is dead, it shall be sent. I believe this name was given by God as a prophecy when the son of yours dies, I'm going to send the judgment. And Enoch started walking with God. In fact, he became a preacher. You know what he preached? We have a record in the book of Jude. It says here, Jude 14 and 15. Kindly read this for me, please. Ready, read.
have spoken against him. Wow, so many ungodly there. But there's Enoch preaching about the coming judgment of God. So was it fulfilled that when his son dies, the judgment came? Where we look at the biblical records, it says here that when Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. And then in Genesis 5.28, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son, he named him Noah. Now we know that Noah was the time when God's judgment came. How old was Noah when the floodwaters came? It says here in Genesis chapter 7, Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And so we try to put them together. So here's Methuselah. At the age of 187, he became the father of Lamech. Lamech, when he was 882, he became the father of Noah. Noah, when he was 600 years old, he, that's when the flood came. And so 187 plus 182 plus 600 was 969 years. And Methuselah, according to Genesis 5.27, altogether lived 969 years and then he died. Friends, I really believe this. The moment Methuselah died, it started to rain. In fulfillment of God's prophecy that when your son dies, it's going to be judgment day. Or you can say the same year, the same month, you can even say the same week, or the very moment he breathed his last breath, it started to rain in fulfillment of God's prophecy. Friends, do we believe Jesus Christ is coming again? Amen. But are we walking with God? Enoch started to walk with God because he knew the prophecy. Are we warning people about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Number five, plenary verbal inspiration does not prohibit personal research. One writer in the New Testament did not witness the life of the Lord Jesus Christ because he wasn't there, and yet he did personal research, and this is Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke said he, inter he interviewed the first eyewitnesses. Okay, the eyewitnesses he interviewed, and then he said, I, I myself have carefully investigated everything. So just because it's plenary verbal inspiration does not prohibit personal research. Number six, plenary verbal inspiration does not deny the use of extra biblical sources. Did you notice? We don't find the record of uh, Enoch preaching in the Old Testament, and yet we find in the book of Jude. That means Jude had another source. This is what you call an extra biblical source, the book of Enoch, for example. And so here are some passages where you have a quotation, and yet they are not found in the Old Testament. They are quoted from another source. And that's what you call an extra biblical source. So just because we believe in plenary verbal inspiration does not mean we don't believe, you know, uh, that there are extra biblical sources. Okay? It does not deny the use of extra biblical sources. Okay? You have those three uh, verses there. I don't know if you, if you have that in your uh, uh, handbook or your manual. And by the way, somebody commented, of course, the Bibles that we have today, the paragraph divisions, the chapter divisions, they're not inspired, all right? Because when they wrote them, you know, uh, letter by letter, and then, you know, they're all connected. They didn't have chapter divisions. So they are, they are a guide to us, but you don't have to be, you know, uh, limited by it. You can disagree with the paragraph division. You can disagree with the paragraph title. It's okay. You know, they're not inspired. But that would be a, already a good uh, source in understanding the passage. Number seven, plenary verbal inspiration does not overwhelm, ito yung sabi natin kanina, does not overwhelm the personality of the human author. The Bible writers experience no coma-like trances while God woodenly dictated to them uh, the Bible to them. And so uh, it's not automatic writing, you know, hindi na dumaan sa utak, diretso sa kamay. You know, we believe that God was able to use their mental faculties, their vocabularies. But through the Holy Spirit, He was able to choose exactly the right words within their vocabulary, within their own experience, what God wants to communicate. Number eight, plenary verbal inspiration does not mean uniformity in, in all details given in describing the same event. Again, sometimes we, we, we look at the Bible you know, it's got to be one-to-one -one correspondence in everything. But, you know, it doesn't mean all the details should be the same in describing the same event. Let's give you an example. Let's say there are four witnesses to a particular crime. Uh, let me just ask some brothers here. Maybe brother, uh, Pastor Hill. Pastor Hill, kindly stand. Pastor Hill is one there. And then maybe there at the back, kindly, uh, can I ask somebody to stand there? There, see, Pastor, yung naka-blue. 
Pastor, can you stand? Yes. Yeah. Pastor, I'll just use your illustration. We have two witnesses here. We have two witnesses here. Pastor Rick, can you stand? Pastor Rick here. And then there at the back. Uh, Pastor, uh, can you stand? Yes. Like a black shirt. Yes. Please stand. Yes. Let's say we have these four witnesses. And there was a crime here in the middle. Something happened. All four witnessed the crime. And then all four of you were called by the judge to describe what happened. Okay, what you saw. Now tell me. If all these four will describe the event in exactly the same words, exactly the same words, describing the same event, what will be the conclusion of the judge? There was collusion. Okay lang na magkaiba-iba yung details ng apat because some of the things you saw, he did not see. Some of the things you saw, he did not see. It's okay. In gathering evidence, you get all the big picture and try to put them all together. All right? You may take your seats. Thank you. So here, for example, when we have the gospel accounts of what was written on top of the cross, on top of the head of the Lord Jesus, what was written on it? Now, we call it Inri today. Now, obviously, they were not using uh, those initials there. It's actually the Latin for Jesus. That's the letter I. Jesus is I. Nazarenos is N. And then Rex is King. And then the Jews, again, is letter I. And so that's Inri. But according to Matthew, what was written, Matthew said, according to his record, he said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So that's letter I, letter R, letter I, Iri. Okay, that's according to Matthew. And then according to Mark, it's letter R, letter I, Ri. According to Luke, letter R, letter I, Ri. And then according to John, I, N, R, I, Inri. Now tell me, which of the four witnesses is telling the truth? Which of the four is telling the truth? All four are telling the truth. Alright? So they don't have to agree on all the details. What you need to do to get the full picture is you put all the details together. This is Jesus, the King, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the You put all the details together to get the full picture. So again, sometimes when we see these differences in the Old Testament, in the, uh, you know, some of the references with Chronicles and then with Kings, and some differences in the details, that's okay. Alright? But a better explanation why they are different is because in John 19, it says there, Pilate had the notice prepared and fastened to the cross, and the sign was written in Aramaic. We believe that Matthew's account is the one written in Aramaic because his gospel is written for the Jews. We believe that John's account is the one that is the translation of the Latin account, the Inri complete words. And then the one by Mark and Dr. Luke is the one in Greek. And so that's what you have, Inri. But now there's a group here in Northern Luzon. There's a court group. They said that they are the only ones who receive the, the inside knowledge from God. They're the ones who receive this revelation from God. That the true meaning of Inri actually, they said, is Ilocos Norte Region 1. <laughs> And so, and so they said that's, that's the real meaning of Inri. And that's the Rizalistas in uh, Northern Luzon, all right? You know, that's what I heard they believe. Inri means Ilocos Norte Region 1. And then number nine, plenary verbal inspiration assures us that God had us in mind when He guided the human writers. The human writers may not be aware how their specific words addressing a specific situation in their particular time can be used by the divine author to address the needs of other people in another time. Now, let's illustrate this number nine. Let's say, uh, Pastor Nixon, can you stand here? Let's say Pastor Nixon was reading the Bible this morning and he was reading Isaiah chapter 64. Let's say he was reading Isaiah chapter 54 and, you know, uh, the, that chapter just ministered to him. It really encouraged him. And uh, he was just so grateful to God for Isaiah 54, uh, Isaiah 64. Now, we'll have uh, Isaiah right here. Pastor, let's say this is Isaiah. Okay. 700 years before Christ, he wrote this letter. And he wasn't, he, he, Isaiah didn't know about Pastor Nixon there. And so actually, he was writing to these people here. Can they stand? Itong tatlo lang. Yeah. So here's Isaiah. Actually, his audience, when he wrote Isaiah 64, he was writing to these uh, to this people. So that's the audience that you are writing. And yet, here is Nixon. 
Reading uh, Isaiah 50, uh, 60, uh, 64, and he was so encouraged by what Isaiah wrote. Now, friends, you can be sure that Isaiah had nothing to do with what Nixon learned because he was writing to these people. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit who guided Isaiah, okay? The Holy Spirit who guided Isaiah knew exactly that this morning, Nixon will read Isaiah 64. And so the Holy Spirit was able to use these words in advance, knowing that Nixon will be reading Isaiah 64. So we need to understand here that there's the Holy Spirit guiding Isaiah. He may not be aware of how the other people will learn about this, but there's a historical account here that is writing to this group of people. Our task in exegesis is to find this link. Who was Isaiah writing to? Why did he write this to them? Before we extract anything that, we can, that can benefit us today, we need to establish this first so that we will not go beyond the intention of Isaiah. All right? And so that's, that's the explanation. Okay, let me take your seats. Thank you very much. So that's number nine. And then finally, finally number 10, plenary verbal inspiration assures us that God included all the necessary things He wanted us to know and excluded everything else. So friends, we have the complete Bible already. Old Testament and New Testament canon is complete. You can be sure that God included all the necessary things He wanted us to know and excluded everything else. The Bible is complete. When you want to talk about salvation, about sanctification, and about service, it's already here. Salvation, sanctification, and service, it's all here. Now, we find from time to time here in our Bibles, for example, Colossians 4.16, the Apostle Paul said, Read up, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Now, friends, I don't find here the letter to the Laodiceans, you know, except in the book of Revelation, but he's talking here an actual letter that he wrote to the church in Laodicea. So where is that? Most likely it got lost. Friends, it's not included. It's been excluded. We don't need it. All right? Everything that God included in the Bible are the ones that we need for salvation, for sanctification, and for service. If it's not included, we don't need it. But a better explanation for this is that the letter to the Laodiceans is actually the same letter to the Ephesians. And so that can be a better explanation. So exchange letter kayo, read the letter to the Colossians, and then exchange it with the letter to the Ephesians. But then here's another interesting verse in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. The apostle Paul said, I have written to you in my previous letter, not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, we're reading 1 Corinthians, isn't it? And yet, he said that there is a previous letter. That means our 1 Corinthians is actually the 2 Corinthians already. And so, we had the 1 Corinthians that got lost. And so, again, friends, we don't know where that letter is right now. But since God excluded it, we don't need it. What we have, everything that we need, for salvation, for sanctification, and for service, it's all preserved here already. Everything that we need is ready here. And so friends, that's what implication number 10 means. And so, plenary verbal inspiration. Plenary means equally to every part of scriptures, all the scriptures. Verbal means every word, not just the thoughts and ideas, but every word is inspired by God. So that's uh, plenary verbal inspiration. Okay, praise God. So basically, we've covered everything for hermeneutics. That's already one semester in seminary. So let's uh, give the Lord a clap offering for passing the subject hermeneutics. One semester. Tapos ng one semester, kapatid.